the the spreadsheet that was shared with the students to ask questions there were a few questions there so i'll i'll pick out the questions from there to answer first so one question from kunal naskar is there any specific reason to select 150 by 150 150 cubic mold for sampling concrete for compressive strength test uh, well uh, one one reason obviously is that uh, we need to make a specimen that is large enough given the typical aggregate sizes that we use in concrete we use uh, typically 20 mm aggregate at least in concrete so because of that we have to provide for a specimen that is at least more than five times that dimension so 150 mm is a comfortable size uh, for that uh, and of course uh, the other possible reason could be that most uh, machines are also having a capacity that can handle the size of a specimen so truly speaking that's what i can think of really uh, the idea is uh, initially it came from the 150 mm diameter cylinders so those are standard specimens that are typically used in many countries outside of india and uh, of course india uses the cube uh, based setup for uh, compressive strength determination and <clears throat> that's why we are using 150 mm cubes to begin with but of course if your aggregate size is consistently less than 20 mm you can use a 100 mm specimen also that reduces the quantity of concrete that you need to prepare right uh, we'll move on to the next question that is there in the spreadsheet can we make m100 concrete with glass fiber reinforcement of course you can make m100 concrete without glass fiber reinforcement also you can also put glass fiber reinforcement and make it uh, there is no there's no problem with that except that you obviously have to do the right kind of trials to incorporate the correct kind of admixtures to get your m100 requirement satisfied another question from path joshi joshi in many research chemical admixture dosage is varied to get appropriate flow example in sec chemical admixture dosage may be varied to get the same amount of flow in few mixes also in other studies chemical admixture dosage is kept constant <clears throat> for all mixes my question is is there a better approach for research if i were to study effective effective water to binder ratio on these mixes now if you have to study the effective water to binder ratio then uh, i think it will be, be better to keep the admixture dosage fixed okay usually you can st do studies in two ways one is you keep the water to binder ratio fixed and study the properties of the different types of mixes the other is you can keep the flow or the workability fixed based on which you may have to change the admixture dosage to get the required workability right so based on that you can then design your concrete mixes and then do a comparative assessment uh there's a question from abu bakar who is also on the uh, uh zoom link today does chemical admixture get absorbed only on the cement or supplementary material or they get absorbed on aggregates and sand particles also if they get absorbed only on cement then why so why don't they get absorbed on sand and aggregate particles okay that's a good question uh, see what happens is if there are a lot of fines in the sand there is a significant opportunity for the admixtures to get absorbed on the very fine sand material Uh, the coarser sands and coarser aggregates <clears throat> have a lot of pores on the surface so rather than adsorption on the surface the mechanism of admixture loss will be through absorption that means the admixtures get absorbed by the porous nature of these aggregates the adsorption will happen when you have a <clears throat> fine solid particle like a cement or a supplementary material or even a fine sand so actually when you see that uh, the dosage of admixture is calculated just based on paste studies you may not be able to get required uh, performance in the concrete that you want so you may have to actually do a proper concrete mix design and uh, look at the dosage required for the appropriate workability levels that are sought in the concrete so very clearly that has to be done so admixtures will get adsorbed on fine sand particles also does that answer your question abu bakar or do you have Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We then have a question from Shreesh. Uh, I guess Shreesh is also there today online. Question one: You told about practice of mass addition should be done to maintain paste aggregate ratio. Uh, uh, 
Okay. So can we use volume addition at RMC if we avoid the bulking and maintain? I'm not able to see the whole question here. Yeah, if you avoid bulking and maintain the quality control. See, there is no question of using volume addition and RMC. Uh, you have to do a weight addition only or weight based batching has to be done. Now, what I meant by a mass replacement of the cement is that you replace a certain percentage of the cement by mass. You have also the option of replacing a certain volume of cement, right? Certain percentage of cement by volume. When you do that, the overall volume of the cement paste does not change. So volume of paste to volume of aggregate remains a constant when you replace by volume, not by mass. You got the question wrong. When you replace by mass, you are changing the paste volume because all the other substitution materials have a specific gravity lower than that of cement. So you are actually affecting the paste to aggregate ratio when you do that. But in RMCs, you cannot do volumetric batching. You can definitely calculate the weight of the supplementary material that you need to arrive at to replace a certain volume of the cement. That is a calculation you need to do, right? It's not like you're doing volume batching. You're still doing way batching, but you're calculating the equivalent volume to be replaced. Question two, if the heat of hydration due to use of finer cement increases, it will lead to any change in bound water or water available for hydration keeping in mind the specimen is well cured. So, so what you have to realize is when finer cement is used, okay, it leads to a faster reaction product forming. And usually what will end up happening is that a lot of the finer grains will react first and there will be very less hydration of the coarser grains. Okay, you can't obviously have the single size. There will be a large size range. So the coarser grains are not going to get properly hydrated in the initial stages. There will be diffusion of water through the hydrate layer that will slowly hydrate the coarser grains. So definitely there's going to be an effect of that aspect. Your overall degree of hydration may not exactly be the same. Now, when the degree of hydration is different, the bound water content will also be ultimately different. Okay, when you have the same level of curing as for a coarser cement. So again, you have to look at both the aspects. One, early hydration happens in finer cement, but in the long term, the diffusion of water through the early formed hydrates becomes very difficult. As a result, you may have a lot of unhydrated coarse grains still left when you have overall a much finer cement. Question three, for high strength concrete like 100 MPa or more, we have to increase fines as the aggregate strength is limited to 80, 90 MPa. How will we manage the strength more than 100 MPa using blended cements and SEMs? Now, aggregate strength, okay, 80, 90 MPa is the lower bound. Generally, most aggregates will have a compression failure only beyond 100 MPa, right? So, idea is you are making the paste stronger and stronger and reducing the heterogeneity in the aggregate. So if you come to the last uh, chapter in this course or last few chapters which talk about special concretes, there is a chapter on high strength concrete where I've also talked about ultra high strength concrete. That is reactive powder concrete where strengths of nearly 200 MPa are being talked about. In such cases, you basically will come to a uh, limit of the aggregate size that you can actually put in. If you put large sized aggregate, the heterogeneity is basically going to cause failure much earlier than your required strength. But if you make the aggregate smaller and smaller, it becomes a lot more homogeneous. The mass becomes a lot more homogeneous. To fail these extremely small sand particles, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot to actually do that. So that's why when you make the material more and more homogeneous, the strength essentially keeps on increasing. That's why in reactive powder concrete or ultra high strength concrete, the fine aggregate size is limited to only about 600 microns and we don't even have any coarse aggregate present in the system. So that's how you essentially capitalize on the aggregate strength limits and keep on making the paste stronger. Question four, will the use of chloride accelerator lead to chloride induced corrosion? Yes, definitely. If you have chlorides added in the system, if you uh, recall the lecture on accelerators and retarders, they are not 
participating in chemical reactions from the point of view of they don't become part of the product they are only catalysts or retarders which are affecting the rate of the reaction so chlorides are going to remain in your system so definitely you will have an increased chance of corrosion that's why chloride admixtures cannot be used in reinforced concrete in plain concrete there is no problem in reinforced concrete you should not use chloride admixtures in fact for any admixture that you use a requirement is to show a certificate that says that the chloride content that is brought into the concrete because of that admixture is very small okay i think those were the questions on the sheet we'll come to now the questions in the live session we have a question from prasad how to measure the hydration product csh between two distinct mixes for comparison what characterization technique helps us to do at the end how to represent the results okay now this is obviously a question for a different course we have a course on characterization that is also offered through nptel uh, not this year but we had offered it previously the hydration product measurement by that i presume you mean the structure of such hydration products primarily in csh the structure is measured in terms of calcium to silicon ratio within the csh and for that you have to do energy dispersive x ray analysis in combination with scanning electron microscopy to determine the uh, distinction between the csh there is no macro method to do this okay uh, you can you have to resort to micro techniques uh, either a <clears throat> scanning electron microscopy or you have to probably do a thermal analysis to determine the distinction between the csh types or you could do other sophistication uh, sophisticated techniques like ftir or nmr ravi singh has asked when we heat the concrete and steam curing in the case of railway sleepers how is it different in, than normal curing in terms of chemical kinetics yeah so when you do steam curing the effect is quite similar to what i talked about earlier in terms of the fineness of the cement you increase the rate at which cement reacts okay you increase the rate at which cement reacts so a lot of the finer particles will react and fill up the so called outer product but lot of the coarser grains will remain unhydrated okay now when you increase this temperature of curing you are increasing the diffusion of the water that will happen through this hydrated barrier that forms so slowly but surely there will be hydration of the inner product also but since the entire process is accelerated to a large extent you end up with lot of porosity in the product in the hydration product there is a lot of porosity as a result of steam curing so if you compare a steam cured concrete to a normally cured concrete the durability of the steam cured concrete will not be as good as the durability of a normally cured concrete okay now when you start using mineral admixtures like slag or fly ash and compare the same two things steam cured versus normal cured the differences will not be so large as it is for a plain opc based system okay so there again use of supplementary materials in steam cured concretes will help you realize the same level of durability as you will get with normally cured systems uh, marudu muthu is asked uh, can you please tell the merits and demerits of sugarcane bagasse ash in geopolymer concrete production now sugarcane bagasse ash based on the lecture that is there in this course has primarily a large quantity of silica amorphous silica is present in large quantity not so for amorphous alumina or alumina content in the ashes is not very high okay now based on that chemistry you may not get as good a chemistry to form geopolymer as you do with fly ash okay so there are distinct differences in that respect now that very nature of very high silica content lends the bagasse ash to have equal or superior properties as compared to fly ash if you are processing it properly but in terms of geopolymerization you may not get the same effect as fly ash because of that difference in alumina content so if you use it as a combination material like bagasse ash in combination with slag for instance then you can actually obtain very good geopolymer mixes nilakadmani has posted a question from the discussion forum 
from the image of the cement clinker from the optical microscope, is there any difference in the sizes of C3S and C2S for 53 grade and 43 grade cement? Okay, usually you will not see significant differences in C3S and C2S morphology between 53 and 43 grade cement. Okay, uh, what would essentially even end up happening in most cases is that uh, even the contents of C3S and C2S may not be significantly different in your 53 and 43 grade cement. The fineness difference may be there. Okay, uh, the uh, ratio of the gypsum may be different. Although a lime saturation factor levels are quite different for C uh, 53 and 43 grade cement, but you will see that more or less chemical composition is not all that different for these two types of cement. Purna Chandra Rao has raised a question as it has been brought out that hydration process is a continuous process. Once particles are solidified and if some particles are left unhydrated when they come in contact with water and hydration starts, will particles have adequate space for expansion? And will a group of unhydrated particles have adequate space for expansion complete hydration of the particles? Good question. So what happens is uh, hydration basically stops when there is no space available. Okay. When the available space is occupied by hydration product, it becomes, first of all, very difficult for water to diffuse through. Secondly, there is no space for the growth of the hydration product. So that's why in concretes, even with very high water cement ratio, even if you take the concrete sample after five years of initial mixing, you'll find that there is still significant level of unhydrated particles. And that is because of this aspect only. The space has already been filled up. The water is simply not able to make it to the unhydrated cement through the, uh, through, uh, through the process of diffusion. So certainly you have that problem that you are not able to diffuse. Secondly, if space is not available, hydration cannot happen. So if you keep on reducing your water cement ratio, what happens? You dis we discussed this in class also. I have, in my lectures, I've covered that aspect. When you keep reducing water cement ratio, more of the volume is already occupied by cement particles and very little space is there for the water. In other words, there is very little space for hydration product to continue forming. So beyond a certain stage, the hydration product will occupy all that volume. Your capillary pores will reduce significantly, but further hydration will not happen. So a lot of cement simply remains unhydrated when you lower the water to cement ratio. And again, if you remember, this is the exact concept I brought out in support of why we have to go for cement replacement materials because we don't want to waste cement sitting as a filler. So we have to rely on the opportunity to replace cement with a supplementary material that can as well do the same work of a filler rather than wasting cement in this process. Makrand has asked a question, can we measure workability of concrete in transit mixer at the time of transportation with the help of ammeter test by calculating conductivity? Well, yeah, uh, to some extent, yes, but you have to do a lot of correlation studies in the lab to see how conductivity is related to workability. There is, uh, uh, if you look in the chemical admixtures chapter, I've uh, talked about this experiment or rather this commercial product itself that is available in the US called Verify, right? I had uh, indicated that they have this uh, torque meter that is present inside the truck of the RMC itself. And with that, they are able to actually monitor the workability of the concrete which is inside the truck. That can be done. In the transit mixer, you can use the verify system to determine what is the actual rheological property itself. Even yield stress, you can actually determine inside the truck. But of course, all this requires a lot of instrumentation. It's not very easy. Conductivity measurements have been done for fresh concrete also. It may be useful. It may be useful to look at how conductivity can be related to workability. So essentially what happens is your conductivity is going to be extremely high because of the presence of water. The moment the conductivity decreases, that means water is starting to get utilized for hydration. There's going to be a reduction in the level of flow. But you have to see how much difference you get in the conductivity value in the early stages to really make out a case for utilization of this conductivity measurement as a measure of the workability. So be careful with that, but yes, it may be worthwhile to explore. Ardhamathu has raised another question. Is mineral admixtures costly when compared to cement like metacaolin and GGBFS? Uh, 
no, again, I'm not sure because both of these are mineral admixtures, metacolin and GGBFS. Uh, are they costly compared to cement is what you're asking. Well, it depends on the market uh, price. Slag is, I don't think, costlier than cement, but metacolin will be costlier because it's a specialized material. Right? And the next question you have followed it up asking what is the difference between calcium clay and metacolin? Calcium clay is essentially any clay that is burnt at a temperature that makes it pozzolanic. It could be kaolinitic clay, it could be elytic clay or monmorlanitic clay or a mixture of these. Okay, Just calcined at that temperature to make it pozzolanic. Metacolin is almost a high purity kaolinite that is calcined to about 750 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, it gets transformed into an extremely reactive material. Okay, So that is metacaolin. More than 90% of kaolinite is present in the raw clay that is calcined to produce metacaolin. But calcined clay can be anything. It could have kaolinite of less than 50% also, like what I have discussed in my lecture on limestone calcined clay cement. Kiran has asked, can we get M100 concrete glass fiber reinforcement? Of course, I've talked about this earlier itself. Yes, you can get M100 concrete. You only need to design it with the correct water to cement ratio. To get a reduced water cement ratio, obviously, you have to go with a high dosage of superplasticizer for M100 concrete. And when you're putting glass fibers, your workability is further likely to reduce. So you definitely need to have a very good superplasticizer for that. Is there any research gap in LC3 cement? <laughs> of course, I mean, it's a cement that has just been standardized. The commercial cement manufacturer will only start now. Based on that, uh, there will be a lot of requirement to try and understand whether structurally there are differences between concrete produced with OPC or with LC3. Long-term durability is again something which people are still looking at. Chloride-wise, there's no problem. People always know that performance of LC3 is going to be extremely good. In carbonation, people have reported, of course, higher depth of carbonation, which is expected. But does that lead to corrosion is something that you need to do work on. That's probably a good research gap. Prasad is asking, all I know so far is CSH is mainly responsible for strength and performance of concrete. But how? now researchers are talking about MSH. Is does it also help in the same way as CSH and concrete? Essentially, MSH is produced by magnesium-based systems. Okay, There are magnesium-based cements also that some researchers are looking at. The idea of the magnesium-based cements is that the net carbon dioxide uh, imprint of that type of cement is negative. In other words, it's a cement that actually absorbs more carbon dioxide then gives it out during the production process. So that's why magnesium cements have been looked at very carefully across the world by researchers. But one thing you have to realize, magnesium-based systems are not going to be as abundantly available on the Earth's surface as calcium-based systems. So you have to also look at that aspect. But yes, in terms of lowering the carbon footprint, magnesium-based cements are quite useful. Uh, from YouTube, there's a question from Hari. Why silt content is only restricted in manufactured sand, but not clay as in reverse sand? Uh, probably you mean that why clay content is not restricted in manufactured sand. Now, again, please remember manufactured sand, or which is not the correct word. The correct word is crushed stone sand, which is obtained from quarries, where you take the stone, which is la uh, large sized, and then break it down into sand sized particles. You don't really have clay in the system. Okay. In river sand, the sediments from the river are taken for extracting the river sand. And there is a high potential to find clay also inside this river sand. So clay content can be there in river sand. But when you start crushing your uh, aggregate into smaller size to make crushed stone sand, you can't transform that into clay. Usually you get only silty particles. Of course, some particles are of clay size. But you don't really find clay directly unless the aggregate deposit itself contains clay. That's the reason why we look at silt content in crushed stone sand and clay content in river sand. Ravi has asked, can we get LC3 in India for trials? Uh, as I said, the cement has just been standardized. 
it may take a little bit for the cement companies to actually produce the cement because they are still working out uh, the capital expenses required to set up the calcination units for the calcined clay, right? To produce calcined clay, they need calcination units because they can't use the cement kilns for that purpose because cement kilns are being used to manufacture cement. So you have to have additional capex or you have to look at supply sources where calcined clay can be directly achieved. So all that has to be worked out in large scale. So I'm not very sure when commercially it will be available, but for, but for trials, you may be able to get. I suggest that you contact uh, Tara, that is uh, Development Alternatives based in New Delhi, and they may uh, be able to help you with small uh, 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 small quantities for trials. That should not be a problem. Okay, Tara is based in New Delhi, T-A-R-A, -A, or Development Alternatives, they are also called as. Please uh, reach out to them. A question from discussion forum posted by Nella Kanmani. I want to learn admixture formulation. Please guide me how to learn admixture formulation. Unfortunately, I have uh, no idea about how to guide you on that. It may be better that you contact uh, an admixture manufacturer to get the answer to that. I'm sorry that I don't really have the answer. Magadeshwaran is asking, could you please give me some small calculations that how can we reduce contracting costs by using admixture? Which type of concreting work using admixture makes cheaper? Uh, okay, now again, that calculation is worked out in class also. As I said, when we are using specialty admixtures or even water reducing admixtures, we're able to actually get a reduction in the net cement content, right? I talked about that fact that you can actually lower the cement content also up to a certain extent to produce the same quality of concrete in terms of workability and strength. So when you do that, you obviously can reduce the cost of the cement. The additional cost of the admixture is not going to be as high as that of the cement. Uh, one more question of discussion forum from Prasad. From initial heat burst and heat of hydration plot, when the atom and water come in contact, this interface gets higher energy or lower energy, explains the dissipation of this higher energy is liberated in the form of heat. Yes. So what happens is the cement particles, when they come in contact with water, the interface, basically, you start forming the interfacial bond between cement and water. So the interface atoms or the surface atoms are, as you all know, at very high energy levels. So when that interface actually forms between water and cement, the additional energy is simply released in the form of heat. So that's what is called the initial heat burst. And that happens within a first few seconds of of combining cement with water. Uh, another question from the forum, is air entrainment and concrete can reduce shrinkage up to what extent? I really don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not really aware of uh, specific results in this domain. Maybe you can pick out specific research papers that will give you that uh, answer. Mardha Muthu is asked, can we use 100% calcium clay to manufacture oh, uh, geopolymer concrete? Now, again, calcium clay is an aluminum silicate and it's a very highly reactive aluminum silicate. Definitely, it can be used 100% to manufacture geopolymer concrete. Merits and demerits, I guess. Merits is it's fast reacting. Demerit could be that uh, it's going to be much more expensive than the use of fly ash. And you may still need a slightly high temperature at the early stages to get the geopolymerization done. As compared to slag, slag, you don't need high temperature. You can do that at ambient conditions because of the hydration happens, happening in slag. Abu Bakr has asked, can we have a 100% waterproof concrete slab with the help of integral waterproofing? If we go with integral waterproofing, they will also affect the curing by blocking the ingress of water to the core. Now, Okay, I'll answer the second question first. Whatever you put inside the concrete, that is not going to affect the curing process. In curing, what are you doing? You're simply creating a moist environment around the concrete. That's all you're doing. Okay, you're simply creating a high humidity environment around the concrete. And uh, just by preventing external water from coming in, that doesn't mean that you're stopping curing. You are putting concrete in water or putting a moist environment around concrete so the water from concrete does not start evaporating. Can we have 100% waterproof concrete slab? 
just by integral waterproofing? No. You need to obviously do good engineering to ensure that water does not enter the concrete. There is no substitute for good engineering. All these chemical co companies may want to sell all kinds of products to say that their product can uh, even work with bad concrete. I don't believe so. Water problems will come if your concrete has cracks. right? Water problem will come if you have not designed for water to flow away when it sits on top of the concrete. If there's any stagnation, there's definitely going to be slow but steady water seepage. Okay, Waterproofing admixtures will make good concrete better. They are not going to make bad concrete good. That's all you need to understand. Purna Chandra has asked, there's been many experiments carried out for mixture design for various trends, the different chemical mineral admixtures, any source to get the design admixtures. Uh, I mean, there are so many concrete mixtures that are being made in actual practice where mixed designs are available. So, and the first point to start off, obviously, is uh, looking at papers that have been published in this regime. So, you should be able to find out enough examples of mixed designs. But mixed design, obviously, is local because your conditions locally are different, your aggregates are different. Based on that, you may have to obviously alter the design suitably. Another question of discussion forum in cold weather, percentage gypsum and cement reduces or remains the same? Now, generally, the cement is not designed specifically for cold weather concrete. Okay. Cement clinker <coughs> production happens the same way. You can probably control the gypsum fraction suitably to get the early strength. Right. But at the same time, for cold weather concrete, you may want to apply other techniques. <laughs> to get to that early strength. Just the gypsum correction may not be able to get you that far. Okay, The cement really rarely gets modified for different weather applications of concrete. You have to realize that. Cement modification would imply that you are going for a change in the cement production or manufacturing or formulation. That means the same cement cannot be sold to other regions. This will only happen only in very specific cases where the job involved has a very large volume of cement to be supplied. Okay, where can we get middle admix or low cost? Can you supply or suggest any? Uh, I have no clue. Uh, you have, this, is, this is a market driven thing. You, you can't really have a researcher providing these answers. The market works in different ways. So you have to obviously have uh, an idea about where you can get your source materials from. But all these obviously should be good quality materials. You cannot compromise on that. Uh, another question of discussion forum. How can we balance the ratio of C3 and gypsum for a proper reaction? Okay. Now, again, this is a question more suitable for a detailed cement chemistry based course. Nevertheless, uh, the balance of C3 and gypsum will depend obviously on the type of cement. In the case of uh, ordinary portland cement, there is going to be an excess of aluminate available in your system. Okay, Gypsum will not be sufficient to react with all of the C3. Only part of that C3 will co convert to ettringite. And because there is excess aluminate present, there will be a conversion of this ettringite to monosulfate. But if you want to make a sulfate resistant cement, you will want to reduce the C3A content so that all of this C3A at an early stage gets converted to ettringite and no long-term ettringite formation takes place. Okay, So depending upon what you want from the cement, that's what you want to design for. The other thing about C3A reactivity and gypsum availability is something that we've discussed in class. Okay, You need both to be satisfied to obtain a good early age behavior of the cement. Okay, another question of discussion forum as ASTM and IS Standards both having compressors and requirement of 90% till one year. Is it retarded type admixtures of strength will not attain 100% over control. I have learned from many experienced persons using re retarding admixture gives higher later age strength. Okay. Now, the requirement in ASTM for 90% is only a minimum requirement. Most admixtures will end up producing concrete that give equal or higher strengths. Okay. So, just 90% is given because you have an initial retardation and that's usually carried on for some time. I don't know if the value is all the way till one year, but you can definitely attain equal or more strength as a control mix. 
Nowadays, bacteria is used in concrete as an admixture to cure cracking. Any standard, how practical is this type of concrete? Okay, now bacteria or bacterial concrete is a different subject altogether. One, people have started mixing bacteria into fresh concrete with a nutrient source so that the bacteria basically converts the nutrient source or when it eats up the nutrient source, it precipitates calcite or calcium carbonate. And when this precipitation happens within cracks or voids, it starts filling up that location. And that's how concrete apparently gets strengthened with the help of bacterial concrete. Now, the problem is how do you put your bacteria into concrete, in the new concrete, okay? Again, for research, it makes for very interesting papers. Practically, you have to think about what you can do for all of this. Okay. Second, people have also tried to put bacteria inside capsules and put that in concrete so that when crack happens, the capsule breaks and the bacteria and the nutrients come together and preservate calcite. The crack has to pass through the capsule, right? So how much of the capsule will you put into the concrete? All this is complicating the already complicated concrete system. I am not a proponent of bacterial concrete. I know there are a lot of people who work on bacterial concrete. They swear by it. I have not really come across a compelling reason why one needs to put bacteria in concrete. Okay, that's my personal opinion. As a researcher, people may have very different opinions, but that's okay. But bacterial uh, repair agents that can be put into cracks to precipitate calcite that's a well-accepted scientific procedure. So if there's a concrete already cracked, and then you can prepare this formulation of the bacteria and the nutrient and inject it into this cracked area, and then it precipitates calcite. There you know that you are already having this precipitation going to happen definitely. That is okay. That is all right. But putting fresh bacteria into fresh concrete, I'm really not for it. Okay, Purnachandra has asked, following questions might be a bit different, but with your vast experience, if you can guide me. I'm not sure where the questions are. Okay, anyway, Shreesh has asked, in compressive strength test, concrete fails in a plane where its tensile strength exceeds the limit. So in related term, can we say that compressive strength can be more like a tensile strength? No, no, you can't say that. You are not testing the material in tension. You are testing the material in compression. Just hold on. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so when you do the compression, you know that it's a uniaxial unconfined compression test, right? So you are not confining the cube from expanding outwards. So your compression failure actually happens when the tensile strain capacity in the lateral direction is getting exceeded. Okay, tensile strain capacity which is much lower than the compressive capacity is getting exceeded in the lateral direction. That's when the cracks start appearing. So compressive strength is not tensile strength. Tensile strength, you need to pull the concrete, not push, right? Here you're pushing and there's an indirect tensile effect or poison effect as we call it, that is causing that failure to happen, okay? Now, when you test uh, other modes of tensile failure like flexure, Again, that behavior is a little bit different as compared to real tension. Flexure is basically causing a crack in a different mode as compared to your tensile failure. Uh, the question from discussion forum, you have said that if you use VMA, then we will see the loss of workability. Then why are we using this? <laughs> we are using this because we are using VMA because we want to obtain that property of control of the concrete viscosity or to make the concrete anti-washout, right? Because in the absence of VMA, concrete will wash out inside the water when we do pile concreting, for instance. Or when we do self-compacting concrete, if the VMA is not there, because of the extremely high flowability, there's a likely segregation that may actually happen. With the presence of the VMA, 
the segregation can be avoided. Uh, from YouTube Live, Murli Krishna has asked, an SDC or SCC contraining technology, cracks are common or any reason? No, cracks are an indication that concreting has not been done properly. The concrete inherently should not crack. Okay. If concreting is not done properly, then cracks happen. Now, why do cracks happen in SCC or in smart dynamic concrete, which is another form of SCC? The name has been given by some commercial manufacturers. Essentially, concrete is highly flowable in these kinds of concrete, right? Self-compactable. Very high amount of fines are used. More often than not, you use fly ash. More often than not, you use a high dosage of superclassizer. The net effect on the concrete is it sets very slowly. When concrete sets slowly, there is, this, there is going to be a tendency. If the concrete does not bleed, now we can't design mixtures to bleed, right? We need to restrict bleeding. And with the help of metal admixtures, we are completely avoiding bleeding. So when bleeding does not happen, if you have a large exposed surface, the rate of evaporation of the wa water can sometimes cause the drying of the surface to happen. And that leads to plastic shrinkage cracking. Okay, so how do you avoid this? You need to have people with wooden floats to float the crack or rub over the crack if it appears in the early stages. Alternatively, you have to prevent evaporation. How do you prevent evaporation? You start early curing by covering with a plastic sheet, prevent evaporation, or you can cover it with a wet hessian as early as possible to ensure that there is no evaporation from the concrete surface. So concrete is not cracking because of the design of the concrete. It is cracking because of the conditions and the fact that workers have not been placed on site to take care of the concrete if such cracks appear. So in SCC, absolutely important whenever you are making a slab to have workers on site to ensure that cracks do not appear or if they do appear, you have a wooden float to rub the cracks to make them close. Because if you don't pay attention in the first few hours of concreting, these cracks will keep growing. They'll grow, they are not structurally a pro uh, problem, but they will create a major problem for water ingress and they will create a major problem for durability. Contact details, of course, you have uh, access to internet. You can look up my email address in the internet. You can contact me through email anytime, no problem. Uh, in a previous course, in particle packing approach, do we have to take care of Admixture size for particle packing. No, admixture, I presume you mean mineral admixture. Yes, mineral admixture is taken as a cementing component. So if you look at the approach that we have followed in the Emma mixed design process, you obviously have cement replaced with mineral admixtures and the particle size of the mineral admixtures will also go into the overall particle packing calculation. Definitely you need to have that. Okay. Question about super absorbed polymer absorbs only water or any liquid such as superplasticizer. SAP absorb water and cement power solution. If so, okay. Now I have not gone too much in detail on super absorbent polymers. The idea is that it retains some water and releases it slowly as the cement is hydrating. So I have not personally never worked on super absorbent polymers, but yes, uh, it is basically a gel type substance which soaks in moisture in the early stages and slowly releases it. So uh, I, I, I have no idea as to how this, uh, how the different products work, the pre-soaked versus dry and so on. Sorry about that. There's a lot of technical literature where people have looked at SAPs. I suggest that you go through that. Okay. Any other questions from the audience online or on YouTube? Sir, what is the duration of this session? Uh, we'll finish it uh, by 6 o'clock. No, sir. Yeah. I didn't mean to finish early. Sorry? I didn't mean to finish early. We need more time of yours. 
no 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 uh, the session is from 5 to 6 okay yeah. okay how to mitigate uh, some question from uh, youtube live by bully krishna how to mitigate cracks on concrete slabs in aluminum formwork system I, i've just said exactly that basically slabs are cracking because of lack of early curing you have to ensure that there's early curing you need to have workers on site especially when the high flowability concrete is used have workers on site continuously to ensure that there is no appearance of this crack if it does appear float it power floating also helps as a final uh, process of uh, uh, finishing definitely power floating also will help one more question from youtube live what is itz itz is interfacial transition zone which is the bonding zone between paste and aggregate there is a clear description of that in our lectures okay please do look into it any other questions okay can shri says ask can latents lead to decrease in drying of plastic shrinkage no latents is the appearance of a powder like cement on the surface okay and that is actually a result of early shrinkage that happens or sorry early bleeding that happens some bleed uh, basically carries some cement particles along with it on top and then simply after drying out you see latents that is actually a sign of concrete that has not been designed well can we visit your lab to understand and study on various instruments available to study internal moisture humidity and temperature variations uh, i'm not very sure internal moisture you mean probably moisture sensors inside the concrete uh, i uh, my colleague dr radhakrishna pillai is working with assessment of internal moisture and its effects on carbonation maybe you could contact him and get his uh, opinion question from discussion forum by dr vani curing compounds in surface water retainers difference oh so i presume you mean surface water retarders uh, i'm not sure what you mean by surface water retainers so i presume you mean surface retarders surface retarders are sprayed onto the surface to prevent early hydration of the concrete on the surface so that way the surface becomes weak and you can wash it out with a water jet to reveal the aggregates on the surface that is to get the aggregate finish on the surface curing compound obviously is required to coat the concrete so that you prevent evaporation uh, magadeshwaran is asking nowadays geopolymer concrete is growing more many types of geopolymer concrete what combination do you think is good uh now again see geopolymer is produced by utilizing alkaline activators along with aluminum silicate materials now obviously you have to do a design properly to ensure that you are able to get the right formulation on site using it is not that easy because alkaline activators are not easy to handle they are hazardous materials in precast geopolymer can be done in controlled conditions because hazardous materials need to be handled very carefully okay uh combinations obviously it depends on what your precursor material is you have to use what is easily available to you okay elakya has asked can you tell about ferroc i have no clue i, I don't know what ferroc is maybe it's a trade name for something uh, some product but i'm not sure can you describe what this is i have never heard about it uh abubakar is asking please tell me uh, tell something about waterproofing in the concrete itself so that we do not need brick bat coba or other waterproofing method now see again waterproofing there is a range of solutions possible for waterproofing okay there are uh, integral waterproofers there are waterproofing membranes okay waterproofing uh, compounds that added coatings there are uh, penetrants okay sealants all those kinds of things are applied to the concrete post concreting okay our traditional methods of brick bat coba are actually not good we should not be using those methods because brick bat coba basically provides a sink 
to absorb all the moisture and this moisture slowly makes it ma makes its way through contact so my suggestion is not to use brickbat coba you have to look at the solutions available from construction chemical manufacturers who have these treatments but please mind you all of these treatments which are elastomeric which are uh, sealant based right all of these have a fixed life they are all organic materials polymers upon exposure to sunlight they will slowly lose their effectiveness so every 5 years or so you'll have to probably do a treatment to relay your waterproofing system so you can either do integral waterproofing inside the concrete or you should do a waterproofing treatment on top of the already placed concrete now again i'll reiterate what i said before you cannot do away with good quality concreting or simple basic engineering practice in a terrace your slope has to be properly maintained right you if you don't maintain that slope water will collect no waterproofing material is completely going to eliminate water penetration if your concrete is bad if your concrete is good yes you can do a lot sir which one is more effective uh, i mean to say uh, uh, which one is more effective like if we use uh, integral waterproofing or post concreting no integral waterproofing is not as effective as the treatments that you can do to the concrete beyond okay again please remember that uh, when you do these treatments they are exposed so they have a yes. fixed life so you have to replace them once in a while so isn't there any possibility uh, without uh, that post methods of that construction chemicals what do you mean with without using the uh, construction chemicals waterproofing methods uh, like we add we add something to the concrete only so that it becomes uh, 100% waterproof not 100 so we 90% almost no see again i, I told you right Con concrete if it's a good concrete yeah you yeah. as long as you are making a concrete well there is no reason water will penetrate through concrete is water can get absorbed to some extent but penetration of this wa water to a large extent can be avoided by using concrete grades that are high concrete has that has good quality mineral admixtures and chemical admixtures can be designed to have very high degree of resistance to water penetration that's what we do our water penetration test for no, in site when we make concrete bridges and concrete uh, 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 girders and all that we have typically today in most construction projects a requirement for satisfying the water penetration test so those are achieved only by using high quality concrete with low water cement ratio and mineral and chemical additives chemical additives i just mean regular super plasticizer okay but uh, i mean if you are talking about a regular residential construction how will anybody agree to use m45 m50 concrete in a terrace the requirement there for strength is only m25 right so in such cases yes, how do you make that concrete well m25 concrete will have a high water cement ratio so it is yes. going to absorb moisture it is going to water is going to penetrate you only have to ensure that you have good engineering practice sloping of the terrace should be proper your drains should not be clogged so water has to be able to flow out of the building as easy as as easily as it can thank you sir okay, chetan is asking uh, i listen one of the best ingredient in concrete is coffee seeds i have never heard about use of coffee seeds in concrete there is a much more obviously with coffee you can do a lot lot better than mixing it in concrete please don't do that okay please make coffee and drink it it's better don't put it in concrete uh from youtube live there's a question what is your opinion effective of retarder for uh, soil stabilization i have no idea why you would use a retarder for soil stabilization i'm not very sure why okay uh while designing a concrete with multiple admixtures we can easily identify initial properties how to determine long term properties i'm not sure what you mean by that initial properties means what magadeshwaran would you like to explain what you're saying uh sir uh, like long term properties like durability or uh, like uh, other factors uh, how well it can withstand that uh, uh, features uh? No, durability you can definitely determine no 
uh, in most concrete which is designed to be durable, durability has to be assessed in the fresh concrete. That you have to assess it in the fresh concrete and ensure that your concrete is able to meet the demands of durability that are likely to be there in the environment that you're doing the concrete in. Okay. So that has to be done. Uh, sir, but it will not be same for uh, another 15 years or by 20 years, it will not be the same, no, sir. No, no. See, there is no easy way to simulate a long term performance of the concrete in a short term test that you do in the lab. You can only have indicators for the quality of the concrete. That, that is what we are trying to study in infrastructure projects. When we design concrete for durability, we specify a chloride permeability, a water absorption, water softivity, or whatever it may be. Those are indicators. Those are just numbers that indicate that, yes, this concrete has the potential to be durable. Now, during its usage, if there's a big crack that appears in the concrete or during placement, that obviously is going to reduce the overall life of the concrete uh, element, right? But that is not because of the durability parameter not getting satisfied. That's because of the way that concreting has been done. So there is no uh, way to perfectly simulate everything. But there are models that can help you understand that, okay, based on this initial characteristic, my concrete is going to survive so much in a given environment. That you can do. There are available models to study that. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, Elakia has given explanation. Ferroc is produced from recycled materials such as waste steel dust and silica from ground up glass. The steel dust reacts with carbon dioxide to produce iron carbonate, which becomes ferroc after solidification. Okay, I have not known about this. I am not very sure about how this works. Uh, from YouTube Live, soil stabilization with blended cement, water content added is too low. Will that be enough for retarded effectiveness? No, the cement used in soil stabilization is of a limit that is very less. Okay, about 2%, 5% maximum is used in soil stabilization. You don't add too much more cement than that. I don't think you need a retarder for that purpose. Another question of YouTube Live. Workability is an issue with geopolymer blends. What admixture is suitable and is the mechanism of steric hindrance applicable to GPC as well? Now, again, you have to look at uh, workability in geopolymer slightly differently. It's not the same as in plain concrete because, uh, again, your workability loss is going to be determined by how fast your dissolution of the aluminum silicate is happening. Now, you probably have to tackle that a little bit different. So, I'm not sure how well we can do that with the help of uh, regular super plasticizers. But yes, regular SPs can also be used. You can adjust the uh, initial workability, but I'm not sure about loss of workability, how that can be compensated easily. Okay. What mineral admixtures would be suitable to explore for further reduction of LC3 content beyond 50% in LC3 blends? Now, LC3 is already a blend with 50%. No? Why would you need more mineral admixtures to reduce further? You can reduce with limestone, calcium, clay itself, clinker content to 35% also. But again, you have to design that concrete for the specific application. You can't con continue to keep reducing clinker content because you need that calcium hydroxide from clinker reaction or cement reaction for any mineral admixture to be active. You also need some amount of calcium hydroxide to regulate the pH of the concrete. So you can't keep on reducing clicker content beyond a large limit. China has been using expansive uh, agents in concrete for decades. Is there some reason why it's not popular? Okay, expansive agents are basically calcium sulfur aluminates. Okay, now these are used when you want to bring in shrinkage compensating ability or expansive ability in the concrete to prevent the formation of drying shrinkage cracking or for specific applications like repair mortars and stuff. It is highly expensive to use in regular construction. That is why it is often a part of formulations for repair materials. Even in India or in any other country, many of the repair mortars that are typically designed as non-shrink mortars always have the expansive ingredient present in them. Okay, So it's not, it's not intended to be used for regular construction. Okay, I think we are out of time. I'll stop with this. Uh, thank you all very much for attending this session. I hope it was useful and I wish you all the best for the rest of the course. I'll again have a, another live session in one month. So thank you for, jo for joining and uh, yeah, good luck with everything. Thank you so much sir, for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you sir. Thank you.